Hello, 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 hello. Welcome back to the HQ. It's the Big Dog Studio. <clears throat> Ooh. It's your man's Nicholas, rocking the cutoff sleeves hoodie in honor of Uncle Bill. For all y'all that said Patriots minus four was a dumb play, that they were done, that the dynasty was over. Uh, here's what I say to that. Always fade the public. Y'all are the public. So I faded y'all. Shout out Uncle Bill. Shout out the Pats going to... Was it the eighth straight AFC championship? That's not what we're here to talk about. As the 2018 NFL season wraps up, uh, the, the fantasy football season obviously is already finished. Now, like anything in life, you're going to have your trials and tribulations, whether it's relationships, friendships, business, school, sex, whatever. There are going to be problems. You are going to learn some lessons. And that is the same with fantasy football. This year was a big year of lessons for your man. I feel like I truly evolved this year. I feel like I really broke through in terms of fantasy. Like, I'm still a piece of shit as a person. But 2019, like, we're going to dominate that for real. My audience, if you're all following me, 2019 is going to be a monster year. I promise you that. I understand the game way better than I did before. Both fantasy football and football NFL from, like, a schematics and uh, strategy and that kind of standpoint. Thanks in part to a lot of the great minds in the industry uh, Warren Sharp and Evan Silva, Graham Barfield, a lot of these guys have put a lot of work in and come out with some great content that helps, you know, the masses learn a little bit more about the game. And that's what I'm here to do, right? I am someone who likes to get into the numbers and, and grind a little bit, but when I find the best resources out there for y'all, I'm trying to teach you to fish so you could eat for the rest of your fantasy football days. So that being said, I'm going to share with you my top takeaways, my top lessons learned from the 2018 fantasy football season. When I originally started this post, this video, I was like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to do like my top five. I think that would be good. But I realized like the more I went on, I was like, okay, here's 10, 15. Like I got up to like 25 bullet points that I thought were really big takeaways that you guys could learn from. So we're actually going to break this into two different parts. We're going to do probably the top 10 today. Not top 10. This is in no particular order. These are just the 10 that came off my head first. And I put it onto paper that way. We're going to break it into two videos, though, just split up because there's too many to do in one video. It would probably be far too long. And one more caveat is these are my personal takeaways. These are my biggest lessons learned from this year. So I'm not going to be including things like draft a quarterback late in fantasy football because I'd, I'd done known that like five years ago. There are people that just learned that this year. That's great for you because you will be able to use that tactic next year, of course. But that is very basic uh, basic level stuff. And I've been doing this for, for a minute now. Um, and, and a lot of these things are somewhat basic to me. So these are my personal takeaways this year that will help me progress into a better, better fantasy football player. And hopefully you guys can also learn from them. Um, before we start the video, obviously, if you enjoy, if you find value from it, a thumbs up is always very much appreciated. It lets me know that you appreciate the hard work I put into this. And uh, I would like to know some of your key takeaways from this fantasy football season because I learn a lot from you guys in the comments as, as much as you guys learn from my videos. So let me know like your top two or three takeaways from the 2018 fantasy football season. And this is looking at it from more of a strategic and uh, theoretical standpoint, not so much like... <coughs> uh, LeGarrette Blunt sucks, you know, not, not that kind of stuff. So do that for me. Drop a comment, hit the thumbs up down below, and let's get into it. First thing I learned, or first biggest takeaway from the 2018 fantasy season is that coaching changes can be absolutely massive to a fantasy football player's outlook. I learned this early, and I learned this often. If you have been following me for a minute now, you know I invested heavily in David Johnson in fantasy drafts this year. I owned him in three of my five redraft leagues. Thankfully, the rest of my teams worked out pretty well, or the rest of my picks worked out pretty well, to the fact that he didn't drag me down too much. But, you know, if you missed on a couple other early round picks and David Johnson was your first round pick you were fucked this year so David Johnson man I, I mean I don't want to get personal here you know I don't want to start talking about names or anything but fuck Steve Wilkes fuck you David Johnson Mike McCoy fuck you Byron Leftwich, you're cool you're cool man I'm out no, but for real, these types of things are far more important than I actually realized going into the 2018 year. Obviously, I know coaching changes can be important, but for the most part, like the middle of the pack, like most things in life, the, the spectrum 
you know, is one end of the extreme, the other end of the extreme, and a lot of the middle are not so much affected. But there are going to be guys like David Johnson, and there are going to be teams like the Chiefs and the Rams, right, who have those elite head coaches and elite play callers that no matter who you throw into the mix there at running back, at wide receiver, they are going to produce. And then you have teams like the Cardinals where you could have David Johnson, an elite talent who won't produce because of Mike McCoy's horrible offensive scheme that I should have probably picked up on um, prior to the season because we saw him absolutely bury Melvin Gordon. And uh, Melvin Gordon's a pretty good running back, right? So Mike McCoy was the reason Melvin Gordon struggled his, his rookie year and, and so on and so forth. So the way I would look at this going forward is to, first of all, keep a, a close eye on who the offense coordinators and the head coaches are that are coming into these new teams. Now, I know there have been a lot of changes recently. I will have a video up as soon as the uh, other head coaches are finalized, I know the Jets and Miami are still looking for a head coach and there's a couple teams looking for offensive coordinators. So I want to make sure that everything's officially wrapped up before I do a video breakdown on the coaching changes, which I will do. So stay tuned for that. The uh, What I'll be looking for, though, is, is making sure I know who's actually calling the plays, what scheme they're kind of going to be using in their offense, because, you know, you could break down five different coaches on a team, right? You'd be like, oh, this is their quarterback's coach. This is their offensive coordinator. This is their head coach. Only one guy's calling the plays. You know what I mean? So that is going to make a difference. When you have Mike McCoy who runs the ball up the middle every single time on first and 10 and then on second and nine, you are not going to have success as a fantasy running back. So those are things to keep an eye on. That is something I will personally be keeping much closer of an eye on going forward. Number two, get your mans. Get your mans. Now, this is not something I personally learned this year, but it is something that I took more into effect this year. And what I mean, get your mans, is trust your gut and the guys that you like in fantasy, the guys that you want to own on your fantasy football team, draft them. Draft them. Otherwise, you will regret not picking them, especially if they blow up. If you choose your guys, one of two things is going to happen. It is not going to work out, and that's fine because at least you have no one to blame but yourself. Or it's going to work out, and then you're going to feel like a fucking million bucks. But if you start picking players based on where they should be going, like, you know, you did a million mock drafts, and this guy never falls that late into the draft, but he happened to fall that late to you in your actual um, fantasy draft this year, even though you don't like him that much, you took him because you feel like you had to. Don't do that. Do not pay too close of attention to ADPs, guys. The reason why, the first snap that happens, week one NFL season, the first snap takes off, guess what happens? ADPs go out the window. The next week, if you had to redo your rankings, it's going to be completely different. So don't get stuck on picking a guy at pick 20 because he's his ADP was 14, but you'd rather have the guy whose ADP was 25, right? Get your guy. Get your guy. If you have a really good feeling about a guy, make sure you get him even if he's not supposed to be going that early in the draft. Now, there is a time and place for ADPs, right? They tell you where the, the majority or the consensus of people will be drafting that specific player. So I'm not saying pick a guy who's getting drafted in the fifth round in the third round because you could still wait till the late fourth or even the fifth round. That's something you're going to have to pro uh, practice in mock drafts. But I've been here before, like two years ago in the E-Town Get Down draft. I was in the middle of the third round and it was like pick 26 or 27. Des Bryant was still on the board. And at that time, I hadn't seen Des Bryant fall past pick like 20 in any of the thousand mock drafts I did in the summer. So I'm like, Ugh, fuck, I feel like I have to take Des Bryant here. Although I didn't want him, I wanted to take Keenan Allen. Like if you go back and watch the E-Town draft two years ago, I was in the camera, I was talking, I was like, I'm debating between Allen and Des, but I feel like I need to take Des here. So I took Des. Des obviously had a fucking horrible year that year. Keenan Allen had an incredible second half of the year, probably would have helped me not do poorly that year. But that's the point. Get your mother... Mm guy. Number three, diversify the revenue, people. This is something you have probably heard me say throughout the offseason. This is something I will continue to say. If you are in multiple leagues, if you play in two or more fantasy football leagues, diversifying, diversifying your players on your teams is absolutely crucial. As I said, I took David Johnson heavily in my drafts this year. Huge mistake on my part, but I diversified the rest of my teams in many different ways. The reason that diversifying is so important, I actually think diversifying in the first round or the earlier picks 
are are very, very, very important because those picks are so important that if if one of your players busts like David Johnson, you want to make sure that you you know you took a Todd Gurley somewhere and you took a Zeke somewhere else. When you go into a fantasy season. I'm going to have my opinions on every single player, as are you. Some of you are going to disagree with a lot of the player opinions that I have, and I'm going to disagree with a lot of the player opinions that you have. That being said, we're both going to get 50% of our predictions wrong. You have to know that. You can't be like, no, I like 100% of my opinion, so I'm only going to draft based off my opinions. You got to go into the year knowing that you are going to get a lot of shit wrong. If you're in four draft, four leagues like I am, It's good to take a player that you hate in one of those leagues because you are going to be wrong on a lot of shit. So if that player blows up, which is a definite range of outcomes for a specific player that you don't like, you're fucked because you don't have him anywhere. But if you have him on one team, then guess what? He is probably going to help you win that league because you diversified. That being said, that's why I like I don't argue with people in my comments. People come onto my videos if I do a player analysis and be like, they'll come on and comment like, "You're stupid. This is not how this is going to happen." Blah 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 blah. I don't argue back. I'm like, okay, that's your opinion. I'm going to be wrong on a lot of shit, and so are you. So if you're going to be an asshole, you're going to be the one who's going to sound like an asshole. So stop being assholes in the comments. I don't care if you're on my. Stop being an asshole in, in in real life. Can we all just be nice people? Jesus Christ. Number four on the list is be a nice person. That's what I learned this year. It's just always good to get a mix of players on your team because you know you might have drafted really well say you had drafted you know AJ Green Emmanuel Sanders whatever like these guys they obviously did not win you the championship so it just makes you super 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 vulnerable plus I think it makes it funner because you you own a lot of stocks of different guys and uh, depending on how they do it's like yeah I own him somewhere I own him somewhere it's not fun owning all the same players and it will come back to bite you so if you're in more than one league diversify your team when you are drafting. It would not have been fun if you took Chris Hogan with your fourth or fifth round pick in every one of your four drafts when Juju could have been two of your four picks. You know what I mean? So make sure you do that because like I said, the key principle here is that you are going to be wrong on a lot of things and you just have to go into the year accepting that. doesn't feel good at first, but you just know like that it's going to feel good when you're wrong, but you have the right player on your team. Number four, running backs don't matter. Running backs don't matter in real football. They matter so damn much in fantasy football, though. Two different things. In real football, running backs literally don't matter, guys. The the closest example I can give you is look at this playoff weekend. Todd Gurley can't play, barely plays. C.J. Anderson comes in, the guy off the streets, and does exactly what Gurley could do for the last three or four weeks of the season. Guys, it doesn't matter. Kansas City Chiefs, Kareem Hunt, oh, one of the best running backs in the NFL, which I do agree on. But the level of delta between running backs and their backup running back in terms of production, especially if you're on a good team, does not matter. It does not matter, guys. Running backs don't matter in the NFL. Everyone is pretty much replaceable. There are, of course, there are players that are better than others. Gurley is better than his backup. Zeke is better than his backup. Saquon Barkley is literally possibly the only exception of this rule in like the history of the NFL. But it does not matter. Their value in terms of a football position irrelevant. They have virtually no impact on an NFL game compared to, relatively compared to, the quarterback, the D-end, cornerbacks, wide receivers. So yeah, Todd Gurley, the best running back in the NFL, gets hurt. C.J. Anderson comes in, no problem. What happens if Patrick Mahomes gets hurt? His value to his team, any quarterback's value to their team, is exponentially more important than running backs. I'm sorry. I know a lot of people are going to get mad at me. I'm not getting mad. I just stick with the, the big facts. That's it. But let's move on to fantasy football. In fantasy... Running backs are still king. They are still queen and and princess and and prince and the prince's girlfriend and his wife on the side and the janitor that cleans up after all these royalty. That's all running back landscape. The biggest single advantage you can have in fantasy football is to have a top tier elite. So I pretty much went back and looked at all my redraft leagues this year. And, you know, Todd Gurley, Melvin Gordon, C-Mac, Zeke. Those guys are in every one of my playoffs, pretty much. Maybe one of them missed out on like one playoff team or something like that. Those are the guys that lead you to the playoffs. And it was something, you know, I preached all summer. It's not like a new fact, really. Most people know that running backs are ridiculously important, but I don't think they understand the importance of them over the elite wide receivers. This is not taking into account hit rates, right? You know, the top running backs might bust at a much higher level than the top wide receivers. They seem to be more consistent on a year over year basis. But what I'm saying is if you do hit on an elite running back, it is much more valuable to your fantasy team than hitting on an elite wide receiver. Why is that, right? Julio Jones finished the year as wide receiver five in fantasy football, averaging 16.7 half points 
half point PPR points per game on the season. The wide receiver 20 this year in fantasy football. Julio's wide receiver 5, 16.7 points per game. The wide receiver 20 averaged 13.1 points per game, which is a 3.6 difference, a week over week difference of 3.6 fantasy points per game. So with Julio, when you dive into like the running backs, look at Melvin Gordon, for example, running back two this year in fantasy football, averaging 22.6 fantasy points per game. If you go down to just RB10, from Julio, we look from uh, wide receiver five to 20. But if you look at running back 10 this year, you drop off to 15.4 fantasy points per game, which is a 7.2 point drop off compared to Julio's 3.6 drop off. That was double the positional advantage you're getting with an elite running back for half the ranking drop. Um, if you want to be comparative, you look at RB5, which was Kamara this year, <clears throat> excuse me, averaging 20.3 fantasy points per game. Chris Carson, all the way down at running back 20, is averaging 11.3 fantasy points per game, a nine point week over week drop off. So from wide receiver five to wide receiver 20, you're getting a 3.6 points per game drop off. From running back five to running back 20, you're getting a nine point week over week drop off, guys. And this little wide receiver renaissance we're seeing right now, pretty easy to predict just seeing how the quarterbacks in the you know the NFL was progressing don't change the fact that fantasy running backs still got that sauce man number five injury optimism is too real players that get hurt in the preseason avoid them at all costs the perfect examples this year were Doug Baldwin Greg Olson Randall Cobb Jarek McKinnon all these guys you could see the injuries coming from a mile away. I wanted, as soon as they happened, telling you guys, please stay away from the guys that are already injured. And if you watch the E-Town Get Down draft this year, the live draft me and my friends do, I did end up taking Baldwin and I got Greg Olson. The reason I took them was because I got Baldwin in the sixth round, right? Originally, he was like a third round pick. The injury dropped him down to a sixth round pick. I got Greg Olson in like the ninth or 10th round. So both of them I saw as values. However, I learned my lesson this year that I'm they're just off my draft board at this point. Morale is low downstairs. I'm starting to make draft picks that are super uncharacteristic of me. I hate how my team is turning out. I'm picking injury-prone players because they're falling to me when I should have just avoided them to begin with. I hate my team. Same thing with McKinnon when he had his calf injury, right? He had his calf injury in like early August. People were still optimistic that he'll be ready to go by the time the NFL kicks off. I took him off my draft board. He went from a third-round pick to, if I didn't get him, in like the eighth or ninth round, I wasn't wasting a pick on him. Problem is it's not easy to predict injuries, but it's easy to predict how teams are going to manage these players who are injured. They always rush them back. Players and team, they have both sides working for them. The, the team wants the player back on the field. The player wants to be back on the field. They do not give themselves adequate rest before they hop back onto the football field. And that leads to an extremely high chance of re-injuring re uh, whatever injury they had. And if they don't re-injure that, if they don't re-injure that specific part of their body, like if, if they strain their calf or whatever, they're tending to overcompensate elsewhere. If, if the calf is not fully healed, then that means another part of their body needs to overcompensate for not being able to put enough pressure on the calf because it's not ready, thus leading to other injuries. So stay away from these preseason injuries, guys, especially in August, especially with the soft tissue. If they get hurt in like June or July and they're back fully practicing by August, fine. I'm, I'm fine with that. But if they get injured in, I don't know, like first week, second week of August, it's a soft tissue injury. They miss all of preseason and their ADPs and their draft spot doesn't drop by like five to seven rounds. Don't touch them. Do not find injuries. They will find you. Do not draft injured players because injured players will find their way to your fantasy football team. So we're halfway through five key lessons into this lesson. I want to stop and thank today's sponsors for the video. Y'all know it's fantasyjocks.com. They are the industry leader, the award-winning <clears throat> producer, manufacturer, seller of fantasy football championship gear for your league, whether it's belts, whether it's rings, whether it is trophies. They have awesome like Lombardi customized trophies that you can get your league name engraved on them as well as your champion engraved on them. They have draft boards if you play in other fantasy leagues in terms of other sports and things like that. So shout out to fantasyjocks.com. I know a lot of leagues obviously just wrapped up. So if you're looking for a little prize for your winner, that is a spot to go check them out at fantasyjocks.com. It will be linked below. Use the promo code TAKE10 for 10% off your entire purchase. That belt, I think, is like 130 bucks. If you use 10%, you'll it'll go down to 115 bucks. Divide that by 10 
10 people, you're asking everyone to chip in an extra 10 bucks that you will have that forever. And you will have a list of your champions that will stay on that belt forever. So great investment, great company, great people, great YouTube channel. If you are enjoying it thus far, please make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Number six, we just talked about how, you know, injury optimism is real, right? Everybody wants to get excited about players who are injured. So you're getting a discount on big flashy names. I'm telling you to stay away from them. Now, while you cannot predict injuries, right, you can't predict them to happen, there are definitely players worth factoring their injury chances into your draft rankings and the projections, right? Injury history should be taken into draft capital, at least weighed. You know, it should be something of a risk at minimum when you are drafting a player, especially in the early rounds. The best example of this are guys like Leonard Fournette, Marquise Goodwin this year, Gronk, uh, Devonta Freeman. Now, I admittedly, that last one, Devonta Freeman, I was high on him coming into the year and I completely discounted the chances of him injuring himself or re-injuring himself or whatever. He had shown a pretty good track record up until last year when he was super banged up um, and then he couldn't hold up this year. So something I will definitely be considering looking into next year. The other three guys, though, you look at Leonard Fournette has always dealt with injury problems uh, throughout college, dealt with them during his rookie year. And then we saw that happen immediately. First game, of the 2018 season, he literally like pulled his hammy and pulled his hammy out of 10 games, pretty much. So I need to factor in the injury risk a little bit more to my draft projections and my draft rankings and things like that. Marquise Goodwin had a ridiculously long list of uh, his injury history. It was so goddamn long. It was bigger than like a CVS receipt. He's had like five concussions over the last few years, multiple lower leg injuries. So there was no... Um, he was pretty much off my board because his list was so thorough. Gronk, same thing, guys. He's been injured a ton these last couple of years, and uh, we saw him miss a bunch of games this year. So again, you know, you can't predict injuries, but going into this year, for instance, like Leonard Fournette, I don't think you could touch him before like the fourth round. Some of these players, you have to account for them missing minimum of three games. And the problem with guys who miss two, even three games, you might look at it from a bird's eye view and say, ah, eh, that's not really that big of a deal. You could start someone else. But Within those two or three games that you play those guys, you are probably going to be playing them on the opposite sides of those games, right? So they miss week 10 to week 13, but you're going to play them on week 14 when they come back. You're going to play them in week nine before they left, and they probably gave you shitty games, or those injuries are lingering with them. So you're putting them in at like half of a percentage of production in what they normally would do. So... When a guy's out for, you know, two to three weeks, he's more likely affecting your lineup for more than just those two to three weeks. And a lot of people might, like, combat this and say, like, hey, if you draft him and he's injury prone, just draft his backup or his handcuff. Well, that's not normally the case. It, that's super hard to predict who actually is the handcuff in most offenses. You have, like, Fournette. Like, okay, you could have drafted TJ Yeldon, but they also traded for Carlos Hyde. They had Corey Grant in the beginning of the year, at least. And it wasn't like Yeldon's a shoe in to be an RB1 when he's playing. Devonta Freeman, same thing with Tevin Coleman. Tevin Coleman wasn't even that good when he was the only running back there. Um, when Devonta Freeman got hurt, plus Tevin Coleman was like a seventh round price. So it's not as easy as just drafting the handcuff, handcuff and throwing him in. And that's something to take into consideration. So your player staying healthy is, is luck, right? But in this situation, you can partly make your own luck in avoiding players that have very, very high injury risks. Number seven on this list is just to avoid non-pass catching running backs, guys. This is more important now in the NFL than it has ever been, and it will continue to be big pieces of offenses moving forward, just passing to the running backs, not just on third down dump offs, not just on screen plays, but making them a legitimate part of the game on first and second downs. We're seeing guys like Matt Breida, who you don't see as a workhorse back, right, if you're analyzing them, but he far surpasses the fantasy value, in my opinion, of a guy like Jordan Howard. I know Jordan Howard kind of turned it on at the end of the season, but simply because of their involvement in the passing game, they are so so valuable in fantasy football. And of course, there will always be guys each year that kind of define or defy this rule. Like surprisingly, Philip Lindsay, I think, finished the year with maybe 35 catches. Uh, Jordan Howard, Nick Chubb, Adrian Peterson all did well from a fantasy perspective without being really involved in the pass catching game. But these type of backs provide you with really, really, really poor week over week floors, right? The guys who don't pass catch are going to be game script dependent for a lot of the time. And if their team gets blown out, they're probably going to put you up like 12 carries for 48 yards or 60 yards, whatever it is. You're not going to get a good outcome from them. I'm not saying to avoid them altogether because they have their share of good games. But if it's like a tiebreaker and you're deciding between a runner 
and uh, someone who catches passes, I don't think I, I don't think you should think twice about it. I think the pass catcher is a no brainer. And if you look back at this year, the top 10 running backs for fantasy, the lowest pass catching total was Joe Mixon at 43. And he only played in 14 games. So he likely would have been around the 50 pass catch mark. But if you look at the top guys, starting at Barkley at number one, 91 catches, Todd Gurley, 59 in, in 14 games, 107 for C-Mac, 81 for Kamara, 77 for Zeke, 55 for James Conner in 13 games, 50 for Melvin Gordon in 12 games, 87 for James White. 43 for Joe Mixon in 14 games, and 50 for David Johnson. So pass catching, you need to have a back that catches passes. If you're going into the year and you know a guy is not going to be the pass catcher like Jordan Howard, you can't use really early draft capital on him, guys. It's going to be a huge mistake, and it's going to probably bite you in the arse. You know, over the next few years, we're going to see these, like, old fossil fucking head coaches finally make their way out of the NFL as more, you know, young NFL coaches, more adaptive, more willing to test out new styles of offense, make their way into this league. And they are throwing the ball early and they are throwing the ball often. Of course, it's not always as simple as just saying, oh, he's not going to catch passes. Because how are you supposed to know if a player is going to catch passes? We take Jordan Howard, for instance, right? All summer we heard Jordan Howard is going to be a three down back. He's going to catch a ton of passes. He's going to excel in this Matt Nagy offense. Fake fucking news. So this is a stat that I compiled earlier. Actually, I started compiling this stat earlier in the year. So this is not through the full 17 games. But over the first three games of 2018, Howard caught 10 balls on 11 targets. So he was, you know, over three catches a game, which is good if you're a fantasy running back. That's going to get you around that 50 catch mark. That put him on pace for 59 targets and 53 receptions, which would both be career highs in the receiving department by a long shot. After week three happened... Howard has caught a total of six passes on nine targets. That was of December 16th, which would probably have been week, what was that, like week 15 or 16 probably? So think about, um, that was like the next 13 games. He caught six passes on nine targets. He was on pace to finish 2018 with 20 receptions on 25 targets. Let's look what he actually finished with. Sorry, I should have done this before. So he finished with 20 receptions on 27 targets, nearly the same pace both career lows so he went from being on pace for far and above career highs to career lows that kind of stuff kills you if you are a Jordan Howard owner not catching passes kills you Tariq Cohen is there so know that that's what kind of scares me with a guy like Sony Michelle now he did this like have a blow up game against the Chargers on the ground but if the Pat- if the Patriots are down which is not something that happens often he, he scares me because I think a lot of people are going to start taking him in the second and third round, but I could totally see him being the Jordan Howard of 2019. I like his talent a lot. I think he's a great running back, but they just simply don't use him in the passing game. So Sonny Michel scares me if you are drafting him at his value or where I see his value drafting or even earlier than that. So you need pass catcher running backs in your lineup. Number eight, stay away from running back by committees, especially earlier in drafts, especially in those rounds like three to five, three to six even. The early to middle rounds of fantasy drafts this year was absolute madness when you look back at it. Starting in pick 30, this is ADP from four for four fantasy football. These were the running backs picked in the middle rounds. Kenyon Drake, Alex Collins, Derrick Henry, Jay Ajayi, Royce Freeman, Lamar Miller, Mark Ingram, Deion Lewis, Marshawn Lynch, Jarek McKinnon, Rex Burkhead, Tevin Coleman, Carlos Hyde, Carrion Johnson, Rashad Penny, Jamal Williams, Chris Thompson. Now this was absurd because literally like almost every single one of these guys busted this year. And every single one of them pretty much entered the season in a heavy running back by committee. If I'm looking at it, there was no guy that was clearing away the the featured back in their offense. Maybe Jay Ajayi, but not even really knowing Doug Peterson's history of coaching and using multiple running backs in his on his team on a on a weekly basis. You look at this at this list, right? Drake had Gore there, and despite what people wanted to believe, they said all summer Gore was going to be a factor. Gore was going to be a factor. He was listed as a co-starter. He was getting reps in preseason. Blah 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 blah. People are, are just pushing that aside and saying, nope, Drake's too talented for not for them not to give him a featured workload like that. That wasn't the case obviously people act surprised when those two split carries now Alex Collins is a guy who also had talent and I got probably more excited than uh, you should be for reasons I expected him to kind of blow up this year didn't happen Harbaugh used a committee nearly all of 2017 and all summer he did not once commit to Alex Collins being the featured back there so for some reason I don't know why I thought it would happen Um, I really did, and it just didn't. And all the signs were there telling me not to do it. So you just look at all of these committees, guys. And sure, like a few of the backs, you know, sprinkled in 
big fantasy games throughout the year, but good luck guessing on a weekly basis which ones to play, where to play them. If it's a running back in a bad committee, in a ba- I mean, in a bad offense, fade them all together. Do not waste a pick on them especially near anywhere near their all ADP. So when I say fade running back by committees, I mean at their ADP. If you're going to take parts of their running back by committees, take the ones that are the later picks in the draft, right? People drafted Jamal Williams like myself in the seventh when you could have got Aaron Jones in the 11th. People drafted Rex Burkhead when Sony and James White were the guys being picked after Rex Burkhead. Rashad Penny, Chris Carson, Chris Thompson to Adrian Peterson, Royce Freeman to Philip Lindsay, Carlos Hyde to Nick Chubb. Marlon Mack to, and no one was really picked before him, but he was someone in a running back by committee that was picked very late in draft. It goes on and on and on. So if you are going to take a running back by committee, do not use early picks on them. And this isn't a formula by any means, but like I said, make sure it is at a discount. Most of these guys emerge over the second half of the year. You have to know that going into taking guys in the running back by committee. So if you want to avoid running backs by committee altogether, I can I can get on board with that because since they don't really break out until the second half of the year, you could probably pick them up in weeks like three or four and not have to use a roster spot on them or a draft spot on them um, in the beginning of the season. So if you want to fade it all together, cool with that. But make sure you are on them on the waiver wire at least like a week or two early. Rule number nine. If you have someone playing on Thursday Night Football or earlier in the week, play them in their actual position, not in the flex position. This ain't really a big deal, but what you want to do, it's a tiny little trick, right? You make sure that they are in their actual position, not in the flex position, because in case something happens to a guy midweek, not him per se, but say you have someone playing on Thursday Night Football, you play him in your flex spot. And someone who's in your wide receiver spot gets hurt on like Saturday, you don't have all of your bench players are running backs. Now, instead of being able to throw that running back into the flex spot and the guy that you had in flex play at the wide receiver position, you can't do that. Now you're going to have to draft, take someone off the wire or take a zero on that. So use the guy who's playing early in the week in the wide receiver position. So that wide receiver is in the flex spot. If he gets hurt, you could throw a running back, wide receiver, tight end in there. Number 10, and last for today's video. Again, guys, if you are enjoying the video, if you're finding value from it, please uh, hit that thumbs up button. Very much appreciated. Number 10, streaming defenses is always, always, always the best move in season-long leagues. Another one that's not necessarily new to me, I guess, this year, but it was concrete. It was cemented this year for me. This little chart right here, is the ADPs, the draft positions of the top five fantasy defenses going into the year in terms of where they were drafted. So Jacksonville was the highest drafted defense going into this year. The Rams were second, Minnesota third, Philly, then the Chargers. Their final rank is on the right side. So Jacksonville was drafted as the number one fantasy defense, right? People picked them the earliest of any fantasy defense in drafts this summer. They finished as a 19th ranked defense. And to be honest with you, this chart looks a lot better this year than it does in most years because the Rams and the Minnesota both got within the top six. But normally these are scattered. The top defense rarely, rarely, rarely ever repeats. And there's always someone who drafts a defense in like the ninth or eighth round or something, wasting a pick where you can get a lot of valuable players there. And what I did was I literally went back and I calculated my streaming defenses this year for the E-Town Get Down League, my big money league. And my streams came away with 109 total fantasy points, which was good enough for defense Fantasy defense number two on the year, only behind Chicago. Streaming-wise, y'all know the formula, right? Y'all know that I like to take teams that are favored in games. You want a team, you want to stream a defense that's obviously favored to win the actual game. You don't want a team that's favored to lose the game, or it's expected to lose the game. You want a team that's at home. Streaming players and defenses, quarterbacks especially too, at home is a very big advantage that not enough people take advantage of. Just think about it. If you're an away team, you're automatically starting with a minus three or a plus three, your three point underdog, just based off of the location of the game. If you're at a neutral site, you're at zero. If you are at home, that swings to minus three in your favor. So it's a six point swing going from the away team to the home team in terms of projecting the point total for the game. So you want teams projected to win at home in a low over under obviously because you don't want teams that are expected to score a lot of points and of course you know you look at other things like the health of the players turnover prone quarterbacks rookie quarterbacks things like that offensive linemen versus defensive linemen matchups are huge the other thing when it comes to defenses is that i'm perfectly fine rostering multiple defenses at once if you're looking down the road or i i own three defenses at once at one point when it was more towards the playoffs so especially later in the season i don't necessarily like to do this early in the season but Once you hit like midway through the season, I'm totally fine rostering two defenses at once. One to play for that week, and then one looking ahead. If a really good streaming option is on the wire for the next week, pick them up. 
It works very, 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 very well. If you use that formula, home teams favor to win the games in low over-unders. That usually works out. I, I'm showing you I did it all year, and I came away with the defense number two in fantasy football. So those are 10 of my lessons, 10 of my takeaways. I still have like 10 or 15 more that I think you guys are going to find super valuable. Again, if you found this valuable, a thumbs up, a comment on some things that you guys learned this year, I would very, very, very much appreciate it. Subscribe to the channel if you are new and uh, I love y'all and that's it. So I'm excited for this week's playoffs. I think we might actually live stream during one of the divisional or the conference championship games. So stay tuned for that. But, uh, but that's it. So peace.